One of the most alarming things was just published in a study in obesity reviews. This study was looking at what the general narrative was in regards to obesity, particularly when it came down to physicians and people in sort of the medical community. What was so alarming about this wasn't anything to do with how they practice or anything like that. That's not what we're talking about. It's the fact that the narrative that was generally thought amongst the medical community was that obesity and being overweight was purely a result of lack of willpower, laziness, undisciplined thinking and behavior. And there was really some pretty harsh stereotypes against it. Now, when I say this, I'm not suggesting that they were saying like, oh my gosh, these people are overweight, shame on them, shame on them. No, what there was was a sort of passive dismissal that it all comes down to willpower and that these people are kind of unable to be helped because there's just a lack of discipline. That was the general narrative and that is really scary. And the reason that it's scary is because it means that we resign to the fact that we're just not going to educate because we can beat the drum all we want about eating less and moving more and it's just gonna come down to how hard somebody works. Why is this problematic? It's problematic because even though to a degree it's true, if we had infinite willpower, we maybe could push through some of these problems. The issue is that this reflects policy to a serious degree because the general thought process of like the medical community does dictate how policy ends up flowing and how policymakers think. So if the general vibe is it's just calories in and calories out and people that are obese just don't have willpower, policy is going to continue to reflect that. Let me explain how that kind of looks. It means, okay, well, we just need to encourage people to eat less. We need to maybe put nutrition facts places where people can see how many calories they're consuming. That relies on the fact that we would still have to use our willpower, right? We put nutrition facts on some fast food places, at some fast food places, we put nutrition facts, we put even nutrition warning labels on some things, yet obesity rates are still climbing, right? Because even if you have willpower, you're going to deplete it fast. And even if you can see those kinds of things like, Oh, shoot, that Big Mac has a thousand calories. If your satiety signals are messed up, there's a cognitive dissonance there. There's a disconnect where you can logically understand that there's a thousand calories in that and you can know that that's bad. But if every biological signal in your body is telling you to still eat more, that survival instinct is 100% going to override that logic because we have this prefrontal cortex that might use some executive function and understand those things. And then we have another part that is way older than we know that is going to override everything that says, I'm not getting the signal that I am satiated. So until we can actually understand more about kind of the signals and what certain foods are doing to our body and what processed foods are doing to our bodies, we're not gonna educate properly, right? Like, where is the incentive for policy or professionals to say, we need to sit down and we need to actually educate you on what certain foods are doing. This is what a Dorito is possibly doing in your body. But if we're not willing to look past the just stereotype and the willpower conversation, those conversations won't be had. They absolutely won't be had because the buck stops there. Ultra processed food is a very real thing. And I talked about this in another video. When you look at Europe for the most part, you're looking ranging from 10% to like 30% by and large in Western Europe, ultra processed food consumption. You compare that to the United States and you're looking at 60 to 70% ultra processed food consumption. And you compare the obesity rates. Last I checked, Europe is somewhere between 17 and 20% obesity, whereas the United States is somewhere between 40 and 55%, depending on different regions. Like, okay, there's a pretty darn strong line that we can draw there, right? The processed food, ultra processed food intake does make a difference. 
So step one to creating the right environment so that you can do that, and let me be the one to at least highlight some of the education here, is having as many whole foods as you possibly can, right? Because if your satiety signals are a little bit wonky, at least you can override that to a certain degree by eating foods that aren't also hijacking your brain too. Because with ultra-processed food, you're stimulating multiple regions of the brain, regions that are enjoying the excitotoxin effect of MSG and this and that, regions of the brain that get the satiety signal from the fats, from the sugars, from this, from the salt, from the umami, all of this, boom, brain, Christmas tree, lit up, boom. Okay, then you have even more that you're combating, right? One of the places I would recommend that people start, regardless, is going to be high protein. Okay, and the reason that I mention this is because we have other signals that we might be able to override a little bit. Okay, protein is going to stimulate GLP-1. We've heard people talking about GLP-1 because it's one of the ways utilizing peptides that people are having some success with appetite control. Because GLP-1 receptor agonists, you're going to make yourself feel satiated, so you're going to eat less. But what people don't often realize is that protein is a potent, potent stimulator of GLP-1. So what do you do? Well, you still like your food, you still like to have your snacks. You snack on protein, snack on protein sticks, snack on beef jerky, snack on biltong, okay? Have a protein shake. And I'm not trying to say that in a condescending tone where it's like, it's that simple, people. I'm saying it in a tone of like, this is our best chance, right? Because we are always going to be tempted by certain things, but protein does work in a slightly different category where it's going to limit the temptation a little bit as well. I put a link down below for 30% off of Seed's Daily Symbiotic. I don't really recommend probiotics very often, but Seed has a very, very interesting one, and that's a 30% off discount link. So they have a capsule inside of a capsule. So it has a prebiotic and a probiotic in one. So if you're trying to really make a dent in your gut microbiome and make a serious change, that's probably the only probiotic I would ever recommend. So again, that link down below will get your hands on that for a 30% off discount, and then you can try taking it every day. So because it's a symbiotic, that means that it has like a multi-stage delivery system. So it has a prebiotic that breaks down, which is going to help feed the gut bacteria and help feed the probiotic, which breaks down a little bit later in digestion with their dual capsule technology. So anyhow, that link is down below for 30% off with seed. The next thing that you can do to sort of override and help so you're not gonna deplete your willpower as much is increase your fiber intake. Now, I recommend that you categorize your fibers, okay? Because if you think of fiber, you think I just need to have veggies. That is not the case. Like you can totally hack your way through this a little bit if you want. One of my tricks is using psyllium. If you've ever used psyllium, psyllium is like Metamucil, right? It swells up quite a bit. If you put a little bit of psyllium in say oatmeal, it's going to make oatmeal infinitely more satiating. Now say what you want about oatmeal. I'm not here to bash or defend it either way. Point is, it's just an example. Another thing you can do is take a teaspoon or two teaspoons of psyllium and put it in a protein shake. You want to drink it quick because it'll swell and it would be kind of weird to get down. But if you mix a teaspoon or two with your protein shake like quickly, you won't even notice it's there and it's going to swell inside your stomach. So there's multiple levels of satiety, right? There's leptin, and that's going to be the one that's generally disrupted with like polygenic or monogenic obesity, where those signals get disrupted. So, but then there's also GLP-1, which we talked about, and there's also flat out stomach distensibility. If you're full because you've had fiber and protein and it's actually filling your gut up, there is a different sort of almost proprioceptive signaling where you feel full so you're less likely to eat. So you have to work in these different pathways. How can you make your stomach feel full? Because on paper, fats are very satiating, for example, right? So like if you look at a fat, a fat is satiating because it's calorically dense and it releases cholecystokinin and CCK, which triggers the satiety response. But the likelihood of you overeating fats before you get satiated in most people is pretty high because it's so calorically dense. So if you subscribe to that theory, you'd say, okay, well, I can just eat some scoops of peanut butter and I'll be full. But by the time you actually got the signal, you might've consumed six or 700 calories of peanut butter, right? So in my opinion, it's better to sort of go a different route 
where you're altering sort of the signaling by getting foods that fill you up. So in addition to psyllium, glucomannan fiber, okay, like shirataki noodles are a huge, huge game in my playbook. Like that is something that I use because they're delicious. I can put some marinara on them and then they kind of swell in my stomach. And it's interesting because you feel full, but you really didn't consume that much. And my point with all of this is that let's pretend for a second that everybody is equal genes and has the same propensity to gain weight or lose weight. If you put everyone in a metabolic ward and fed them the same thing and they all had the same DNA, probably have pretty similar outcomes, right? But that's not how the world works. We do have some people that have gene mutations and some people that don't. So in this particular case, if you put those people in a metabolic ward and you fed them the same thing, they would still have the same result because their environment is the exact same. But if you put those two people with different genes out into the world, they're gonna have wildly different results even if they lived in the same city because their environmental cues are going to be bombarding their bodies and that's when the obesity genes and those issues are gonna come into play and be a problem. So the best way we can potentially override this, in addition to like the research that's being done in the world of obesity genetics, is to do everything we can to increase our protein intake, increase our fiber intake, increase how many steps we get per day because it's the easiest way to increase your activity. Stop thinking about how much you need to work out and focus more on how much can you move throughout the day. It's the best ways that you can simply change your environment. Also, simply reducing the types of food that are in your house in the first place. I like to make sure that I grocery shop when I'm not hungry, because that's one of the biggest levers you can pull. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.